Shabbat Shalom, this is Quentin Brooks with Karim Hashem, Messianic Jewish Congregation. And uh, before we begin, I just want to make the announcement that we will be reading the book of Esther in the book, I'm sorry, in English this, uh, this Shabbat after service. Uh, kind of our goal is for those of you who couldn't make it last night, you'll be able to make it to at least one reading. So this Shabbat after service. Let's go on over to um, Leviticus, or Vayikra, chapter 6. This portion is called Sav. We're going to read the first few verses, just following our Thursday reading tradition, and then we'll discuss it. And I spoke to Moshe, Give this order to Aaron and his sons. This is the law for the burnt offering, the Olah. It is what goes up on its firewood upon the altar all night long until morning. In this way, the fire of the altar will be kept burning. When the fire has consumed the burnt offering on the air, the Kohen, having put on his linen garment and covering himself with his linen shorts, is to remove the ashes and put them beside the altar. Then he is to remove those garments and put on others before carrying the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. In this way, the fire on the altar will be kept burning and not be allowed to go out. Each morning, the Kohen is to kindle wood on it, arrange the burnt offering, and make the fat <coughs> of the peace offering go up in smoke. The fire is to be kept burning on the altar continually. It is not to go out. This is the law for the grain offering. The sons of Aaron are to offer it before Adonai in front of the altar. He is to take from the grain offering a handful of fine flour, some of its olive oil, and all the frankincense, which is on the grain offering. And he is to make the remainder portion of it go up in smoke on the altar as a fragrant aroma to Adonai. The rest of it, Aaron and his sons, are to eat. It is to be eaten without leaven in a holy place. They are to eat it in the courtyard of the tent of meeting. It is not to be baked with leaven. I have given it to, um, as their portion of my offering made by fire. Like the sin offering and the guilt offering, it is especially holy. Every male descendant of Aaron may eat from it. It is his share of the offering for Anai made by fire through all your generations. Whatever touches those offerings will become holy. So I just want to review a little bit of what I said last time before we move on to new ideas here. In last week's portion, it was the law of instruction for sacrifice for the average Israelite. This week, it's the instruction manual for the Kohenim. For the priests, how do they offer the sacrifice? That is mostly what you see up until the very end when it starts to change topic into next week's portion. But this week is the instruction manual for the Kohenim. And I heard it put like this, and I think this is very insightful. For many of us, this is kind of a dry reading. It seems mechanical. It doesn't seem worshipful. And that's because the worshipful aspects of the sacrifice are assumed. They are assumed. It's almost like the reader already knows how sacrifices are worshipful. It's in many ways like this. Think about the hymnals. I have a couple hymnals on the back, um, but think of like an old Methodist hymnal. You've got your songs and your prayers and they're all in black letters, but in the red letters you have instructions. Sit, sand, kneel, that type of instruction. It's almost like portion Sav, Parsha Sav, is a book or a portion of just the red letters. And all the black letters, all the actual worship, is not included. And that's why we can read it and it seems awfully foreign and alien to us. But if we could actually see the sacrifices being offered, if we could hear the prayers, if we could hear the songs and see the worship that went into each and every sacrifice, the reverence that went with each one, we would understand how these prayers, uh, I'm sorry, how these sacrifices are important and how they are worshipful. And we have some pieces of that here and there, but by and large, it's left out of the text. And the portion that I, the, the part that I think of the most is that word Ola, the offering literally what goes up. It's almost like the lamb or whatever you bring takes on your identity and then it gets to go up to heaven before God 
and it mingles with him there in the air in the form of smoke. Very mysterious, very symbolic, but also quite literal. And the psalm that I connected this to last week is Psalms 134. I'm going there now. Because you see, we were told, keep the fire burning all day, two sacrifices during the day, three on Shabbat, and then at night, there is a sacrifice that keeps it burning through the night. A song of ascents, come, bless Adonai, all you servants of Adonai, who serve each night in the house of Adonai. Lift your hands toward the sanctuary and bless Adonai. May Adonai, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. We talked about the importance of we get up, we're in him, we're in the word, we're in prayer. We make sure that we're doing it throughout the day. We're in him, we're always seeking him, we're always going after him. It's very important that he is the constant drive of our life. As scripture says, pray continuously. The smoke on the altar has to go up continuously, just like our prayer lives go up constantly. And so in Judaism, there are three traditional prayer times. There's shacharit, which pertains to the morning sacrifice. There's mincha, which actually pertains to the afternoon sacrifice. And then there's musaf. I mean, sorry, ma'ariv. Musaf is Shabbat. Ma'ariv. Ma'ariv pertains to that evening sacrifice, where they would put the portions on the altar and let it burn through the, eve, uh, through the nighttime. Musaf pertains to the additional Shabbat prayer time. Um, or the additional Shabbat sacrifice. But understand that our prayer times were made to coincide with the altar, with the sacrifices that constantly go up. It's almost like it's the perfect times for offering worship. And so here they have a song for nighttime, for those who serve at the altar at night. Let's go over to Psalms chapter 4, and then chapter 5. But let's go to Psalm chapter 4 first. We, I, I tied this into the idea of being in him even at night. I'm in uh, verse 5. You can be angry, but do not sin. Chapter 4, verse 5. You can be angry, but do not sin. Think about this as you lie in bed and calm down. Offer sacrifices rightly and put your trust in not an eye. Now, you can't obviously offer sacrifices once you lay down in bed. But I think what he's doing here is he's taking those evening time prayers that we pray before bed and paralleling them with the sacrifice that would have been offered right around the same time. He says, I will lie down and sleep in peace, for Adonai, you alone make me live securely. And just going to chapter 5 real quick. Um, chapter 5, verse 4. I'll just, uh, just read this verse. Adonai, in the morning you will hear my voice. In the morning I lay my needs before you and await expectantly. Different people translate this differently. I will align with you. I will offer my prayer. I will offer a sacrifice. Is it sacrifice? Is it prayer? What is it? Is it himself? The way I understand it is his prayer goes up at the time of the sacrifice. And in the process, he aligns himself with the Lord. And we can see that Daniel also prayed three times a day, presumably paralleling these sacrifices. Although that's I, I, I would say that's pretty, that's pretty much beyond conjecture. Uh, in the early days, uh, it's, it's hard to say a lot of the traditions that had truly been established, but this seems like one of them. So the idea, three offerings, three times for prayer, Paul says to pray continuously. I'm going to take off my messianic hat for a moment. Not literally, I'm going to keep it on. I'm going to put on my professor hat. I want to share with you a meditation that I've been having recently. And this seems like an assignment I could almost assign my English classes when I was a professor at Austin P. And it goes something like this. There's this, and I'm taking inspiration today from the Psalms. There's this great dialogue uh, that goes around in the English department. Famous English professor, he asked the question, he said, what allows for complicated thought? How are we even able to have complicated thoughts? And his answer was the structure of language. It makes sense. If I don't have a word for metaphysical, 
it's awfully hard to think in the terms of, okay, what pertains to metaphysical. If I look at the word conceit in the poetic term, if that word doesn't exist, it's awfully hard to describe what I'm trying to articulate. Articulate is another great word. Very often, the way we speak informs the way we think. Bear with me, I'm going to tie this in in a minute. So I find it very interesting, for example, that three major feminist waves came out of the English-speaking world. Why is that significant? Because in English, we are one of the few languages without gender. Oh, we have he, she, it, her, him, his. Um, but beyond that, I can't look at this pulpit and say, yep, that's a him or that's a her. It's, it doesn't make sense. It's an it because it's a thing. That's how people who speak English think. And that is completely foreign to most other languages where everything has a gender, including Hebrew. And now you're trying to see things like Spanish X and that type of thing, but that's, that's fringe. It's, I, I don't think you can change thousands of years of language. And that's sometimes why it's so hard for people who speak English to learn another language, and that's why English is actually so easy. It's because gender. Gender doesn't exist in our language. What am I talking about? Why am I saying this? Well, of course we're the type of language and the type of culture that would produce three feminist waves. The first wave, the second wave, and the third wave. And Maybe it's two out of three. Um, oh, I used to teach this, and now I'm starting to lose it. I need to get back into my notes. Of course, we're the ones who produce this stuff because it's in our language. Different languages carry different values. It was said that Hebrew was the best language for prayer. It says that Greek is the most, I think it was emotional of languages, the best at expressing love and deep emotion. Uh, when I was talking to some of my Arabic students, they would say that Arabic is the language of joy and that it's the best at expressing happiness. I wouldn't know. But understand that language and the way we think is incredibly, I'm sorry, the way we speak is incredibly important in shaping the way we think. We are told to bless the Lord constantly. It doesn't say think good thoughts. It says bless with our mouth. And even when we're going to sleep and we're in bed, that's the time to think and ponder. But when David wakes up, it's time to pray. It's to a time to align himself to the Lord. The way that we think constantly shapes who we are. And so here's an exercise for us. Here's an assignment for us. When you think of God, what is the first word or feeling that comes to mind? I'll tell you mine. I had two come to mind right away. He is good and he is holy. But I don't know if those words are really appropriate for describing the divine. Are they? I mean, they're definitely true, holy especially. But I think if I'm not careful, what's the word holy mean? Should I expound on that? Because holy is one of those words that you can just throw out there without really thinking of the ramifications. He is other. He is distant. He is alien to anything that I've ever seen or experienced. He is above it. Incomprehensible. What's it mean to be good? What other words that mean good can work with good? He is kind, compassionate, loving, faithful. And as we go through words, what I want you to do is start expanding the words that we use to think about God. Because I don't know if you've noticed this, holy, that's a good word, but good? It's pretty juvenile. Surely there's a more sophisticated way 
of talking about God because, yes, God is good, but so is food. So, so is a pleasant experience. So is the weather. Do these words, are this really the best word for how we think about God? And my, my, my challenge to you is think about the way we praise God. What does it say about our theology and our view of him? Because very often, I don't want you to mishear this, the way we think about God shows what we can receive from him. If we see God as loving and kind, we have to be able to keep that in perspective with that he is our father and when he punishes us, it's in the context of loving and kindness. Because if we're not careful, we make God just soft, a big softy. And when we find his rebuke in our lives, we are taken aback and even offended. So loving and kind are good words, but maybe they need to be complimented with other words. You might even come across words that you think, that sounds right, and then you'll think about it and you're like, that's not right. I don't like the connotations there. We need to find other words. Point in case, God is kind, but I would never use the word nice to describe God. Kind, compassionate, loving, forgiving, abundantly merciful. Nice, not so much. Nice pertains to a politeness. You can be nice to someone, but not really care for them. I don't think I would use the word nice. But kind is a completely different creature. I don't know if God is sympathetic, but he is compassionate. I think actually compassion requires someone not to be sympathetic. Sympathetic is compassion from a distance when God has offered, when God has made himself so readily available and close to us. Tying it all in, we are told to praise God constantly, morning, afternoon, night. What are the words that we use to express our praise for God? Because the way we praise him, the way we think about him, will shape how we see him. It'll shape what we receive from him. It'll receive how we know him, and it will put limits on our lives. And my challenge to you is maybe it's time to sit down with a notebook and start trying to find ways and words that describe God. And if you write down a word and you think about it, you say, mm, never mind, cross it out. That's good. It shows you're at least trying. But I would also invite him into the process and ask him to show himself to you through the word so that you could find more those words that we use to praise him, those ways that we think to describe him. Because I believe that as we, and I, I don't want to overstate this case, I think that as we praise him and as we fill up our spirit with more of a vocabulary for how we understand him, the more we'll just be able to see him in our day-to-day -day lives. So what are some words? I've already used a few. He is redeemer. He is provider. I want you to think about them. And I just want you to say, who is God? How do I describe him? And how can I keep on praising him?